Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch and uh, welcome back new subscribers. And if you're not one of them, I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Uh, we're having fun with our channel. It's growing and uh, we love your comments and suggestions. Uh, uh, my audience has given me, uh, given me, challenging me pretty good out there, keeping me on my toes. So thank you very much for all that. I try to answer them all and uh, so keep watching. So please subscribe if you haven't. So, uh, a while ago, I made two videos on the subject of selecting a camshaft and matching your camshaft uh, duration, particularly, uh, to your compression ratio. And they generated a lot of information, a lot of information, yes, and a lot of uh, interest and response. Uh, two videos about uh, camshaft duration matching compression are still getting the most interest, even though they're not the newest ones. And as of yesterday, they're number one and two. Uh, on, on the hit list, so in terms of uh, viewer interest. So uh, we're going to talk about that. And what one of the things that prompted this video, uh, I'm going to take a deeper dive into that subject, but one of the things that prompted this video, in one of the previous videos I stated that uh, ideally I'd like to see uh, a cranking pressure, and cranking pressure is uh, an indication or a way you measure your, your dynamic compression in an engine and it's also a predictor of how much power it's going to make. So, uh, and while I'm talking about that, it's not the only predictor. So, the ways that you make power in an engine, the main things is cubic inch size is a huge factor, compression, camshaft timing, and airflow in and out of the engine, which includes your carburetor, intake manifold, cylinder heads, and exhaust headers or manifolds, and even your mufflers are a factor. So, how I think about it is um, the muscle of an engine is the cubic inch size and the compression, the brains is the camshaft timing, and the airflow are the lungs of an engine. And typically, the thing that makes torque at the bottom end and through the range is, is uh, cubic inch size again, huge factor, and compression. And then if you want to make that torque at a higher RPM, you need cylinder heads, better airflow, and camshaft timing. So typically an engine will make a given amount of torque based on those factors. And if you put a bigger camshaft in it, you typically won't make more, uh, more torque, but you'll make that torque at a higher RPM. So the formula for horsepower is pretty simple. It's torque times RPM divided by a constant, which is 52, 52. But just think about torque, horsepower as torque times RPM. So if you make your maximum torque at 6,000 and you multiply that number by your, by your, uh, that RPM by your torque, instead of at 3,000, you're going to make more horsepower, obviously. So that's why a small engine has to go a lot of RPM to make, make horsepower. So, uh, just want to digress on that uh, fact for a minute. And so uh, back to the subject, um, a viewer who watched the suggestion that I said 160 to 180 PSI was ideal, uh, said, okay, if that's good for pump gas, what, uh, how much compression can I have and still use 87 octane? So I wanted to give a, a solid answer based on facts. So I go back to my Trusty GM Chevrolet 1968 manual and looked up the specification. So in 1968, the base engine, which we used to say ran on regular gas, we used to call regular gas, so that would be 87. The other type of gas would be, we all call high test or uh, premium. And so the 307 base engine that's in that specification, two, two barrel carburetor, nine to one compression, 200 horsepower 307 would definitely be able to run on regular gas or 87. So the cranking pressure in the specification for the 307 is 150 PSI. So I felt pretty good about that answer. So I basically said, if you got less than 150 PSI, you're good to go with 87. And then I looked across the same document in the manual and they list all the other, the 327, the L79, the L78, the 396 engine, uh, and the 427 L88 with 12.5 to 1 compression ratio. Uh, 
And lo and behold, the L88 with 12 and a half to one compression ratio engine also has a cranking pressure of 150 PSI. So it follows then that the L88 can run on 87 octane fuel too. So let's leave that one, let's put that one aside for a minute. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that and try to address it and try to make sense of it and explain how General Motors was able to <clears throat> do that back in the day. So um, back in the 60s, uh, when this manual was made, uh, compressions were just getting higher uh, and we had lots of 260 Sunoco, which was 100 octane fuel, so we had no worries about that. And we thought this was going to go on forever. And in 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, regulated that starting in 1971, all vehicles sold in North America, Canada, and the United States, and probably most other places in the world, I'm not sure. But anyway, in North America, had to be able to run on unleaded fuel. That was, for many people, the end of the muscle car era because immediately all EMs dropped their compression ratios the uh, L79 three, uh, 327, 350 horse, for example, had 11 to 1 compression ratio. That was gone, and all the high compression ratio engines disappeared, and horsepower went down dramatically, and the OEMs tried to make up for that by increasing the strokes to get some torque back into the engines, but they were pretty anemic compared to the engines in the 60s. So... Um, and one of the problems was, in order to get make octane, if you can't use lead, the way octane was achieved in the 60s, up until 1970, was with using lead. So now, uh, because engines had to run on unleaded fuel, uh, the only way to do that is mix it with ethanol. And ethanol is basically alcohol. And so typically, in order to get higher octane, you have to have more ethanol. And the problem with that is, Ethanol uh, has, uh, the energy content of ethanol is 76,000 BTUs for, per gallon. And the energy for the fuel is 114,000 BTUs per gallon. So obviously the more ethanol you blend into your gas, into your fuel, the less BTUs of energy it's going to have and the less power it's going to make. So it's a, it's a pretty hard trade-off. To get your octane rating, you have to actually use fuel with less energy in it. And uh, for example, Shell claims that their 91 octane fuel does not have any ethanol. And I do use it, and I've done some dyno tests on it uh, against 94 octane. And sometimes the 91 wins, and sometimes the 94 wins. And there's not a big difference between it, by the way. And we're talking engines with fairly high compression. Ratios. So that's the issue with uh, with fuel and and uh, octane rating. I mentioned uh, in the video that uh, typically I look for 160 to 180 psi of uh, cranking pressure, and, and and I'm pretty conservative in my builds. I build street motors, not race motors, and uh, I'm pretty conservative in pretty much everything, and that's included. Now, if you're watching my channel, uh, I know you probably watch. David Vizard as well, and if you don't, you should start watching him. He's a pretty smart guy. I watched some of his videos. I read two of his books, and I've learned a lot from uh, both of those uh, things. And uh, what the point I'm making is there's a good discussion in one of his books about camshaft duration and fuel octane, and David's recommendation is that 180 PSI is the minimum cranky pressure you should have in a street motor and the sweet spot somewhere around 200 PSI. I don't know if I agree with that, but that doesn't matter. I don't, we don't have to agree. Um, but in future, uh, I've had just questions about this subject as well. And in your comments, if someone's looking for some help in selecting camshafts, I'm willing to give my input and you can use it uh, for what it's worth. And I have mentioned before about camshafts that if you have a cam that makes more horsepower than torque, you're it's probably too big, much cam for the street. And I had somebody challenge that, and they made some good points. You have to take other things into consideration. You have to take the weight of the car, the gear ratio that you're using, 
what you drive, what you drive it for. Are you driving it on the drag strip? Are you driving it on the street? Uh, and a whole bunch of other factors have to be the transmission type you're using, whether it's a four-speed or automatic, your torque converter, uh, stall speed, are all factors. And typically, uh, the lighter your car per engine size, like say eight to 10 pounds of car per cubic inch, the more uh, higher duration cam you can use. Lift doesn't really matter. Lift helps, it matters a lot, but it doesn't change the characteristics of your, of your uh, engine as much as, as much as duration does. So. Um, once again, as mentioned before, higher, higher duration camshafts move your RPM range up and you make more horsepower, uh, but you make less torque. So it's a trade-off and if someone's willing to use, an engine, use a cam that makes more horsepower than torque, recognizing you probably have low vacuum, it'll uh, probably idle poorly and probably have uh, poor fuel mileage, but if you don't care about that, uh, that's fine, and there's lots of hot rods running around that have that. So it's a matter of personal selection, as long as you understand the factors that you're using to make that selection. So once again, uh, in your comments, if you're interested, I can try to be helpful about that and uh, give you my input for what it's worth. So back to the subject at hand, how did General Motors, and I'm sure the other OEMs, Ford and Chrysler, did the same thing back in the 60s, make 12 and a half to one compression ratio engines, using the L88 as an example, with 150 PSI of cranking pressure. Uh, and so I'm gonna use another engine example that's more common that people know more. And I'm gonna make a comparison of the L79 cam, which is the 327, 350 horse cam that was used in Corvettes, Novas, and Chevelles from 1964 to 1968. And I think a few were made in 69 as well, but that's mainly the, the main years that they were used. I'm gonna compare that camshaft uh, to the Comp 268H, which is in this engine right here. It's a pretty popular camshaft. And show you how General Motors was able to uh, generate uh, the kind of numbers that they did in, in, uh, in uh, compression because the L79 had 11 to 1 compression ratio. Okay, so what they did, one of the big factors in uh, for the OEMs is that when they sold an engine, it had to be able to last a, a predictably 100,000 miles, and uh, and so the camshaft had to last 100,000 miles. I don't know too many people that have used their comp cams for 100,000 miles, but some probably have. But uh, one of the issues, one of the things that cam manufacturers brag about is they lift the valve faster off the seat in order to make more power. And it does, it works. Uh, GM did the opposite. They lifted the valve slow off the seat. So if you look at the, I'm, I'm comparing here, by the way, they're at Melling and a bunch of other manufacturers. Summit sells them, I think Comp makes them, uh, retrofit, uh, nostalgia cams. They're not exactly the same spec. They're kind of replicating the performance, but they don't, they're not exactly the same specs. But I dug out the specifications I found last night. The L79 cam is 3863151. You can Google that number and you will get the specifications I'm talking about here. So that's the original cam that came in a 350 horse, 327, 66 Corvette, 66 Nova, whatever. A really nice cam, I've used lots of them. So according to General Motors, I, the term I'm using is advertised duration. The problem is GM didn't advertise it, but according to General Motors specification, that cam at 342 degrees of duration at zero or not at 50. And the knockoff guys that make them like Melling advertise 222, somewhere 223 degrees of duration. So that's, that's why I use the example of duration at 50. That's kind of an equivalent camshaft. So um, in order to last 100,000 miles, they had to use really gentle ramps. So what I did was, I already know the compression pressure because they advertise that, or they, that's in the specifications. So if you go on a dynamic compression calculator, Wallace or others, the factors are bore, the stroke of the engine, the connecting rod length, the position at which the intake valve closes, uh, 
and the static compression ratio. So I already know the compression pressure. So I solved that equation for uh, intake valve closing point. So in order to make a cam that has 242, 342 degrees of duration with 11 to 1 compression ratio, you have to have a valve closing point at 81 degrees after bottom dead center. Comparing that to the Comp 268H cam, which has the same duration at 50, I know that from the specification, and I've degreed them, has a closing point of 61 degrees after bottom, after top, sorry, after bottom dead center. So that's how GM was able to bleed off compression by using a late closing point and large duration. So the ramps, when, when we talk about 342 degrees, by the way, the, the cycle of a camshaft isn't 360, it's 720. So in a cycle of a camshaft, in order for the, the, the valve, the, the, the base, the cam base circle uh, is, cam is off the base circle for 342 degrees of crankshaft duration uh, on that cam compared to 268, which is the advertised duration of this cam. So I hope that's making sense so far, trying to compare these cams, because there is a dilemma here. And the other way to look at it is, if I use this comp, the comp 268H in that same 327 with 11 to one compression ratio, with a closing point of 61 degrees after bottom dead center, it would have 190 PSI of crank pressure. So that's the difference. 150 to 190 PSI of cranking pressure, all other things equal in that equation. So by solving for that, I think I've solved the answer why GM was able to do that. The other way of looking at it is the ratio of advertised duration versus at 50 duration. In the case of GM, once again, GM didn't actually advertise it, but the ratio of 342 divided by 222 is 1.54. Whereas in the comp cams, and this is pretty common, the ratio of 268 to 224 is 1.2. So that difference between the 1.54 and 1.2 are the gentle ramps that the OEMs use to do two things, the bleed off compression and to make their cams last a long time. And they did last a long time. So if you buy all that story, we're back to the original question, does the 427 with 12 and a half to one compression ratio, which has a specification, specification under GM manual to have 150 PSI of cranking pressure, can it run an 87 octane fuel? I'm going to leave you with that one and look for comments and questions, and uh, I'm sure it'll generate some interest. And um, I'm going to thank you for watching this. It's kind of a complicated subject and, and process, but I've had lots of there's lots of interest in it and a lot of misunderstandings because there's a lot of people out there that think you can't run more than nine to one or nine and a half to one compression static compression engines on the street and there are other other people out there running 12 and 13 to one by doing the things that we mentioned bleeding off the compression using camshaft so interesting subject and we're all learning i'm learning from you guys too i look for your comments and i want to thank you for watching gold scratch